Welcome to the New Books Network. Welcome back to New Books in History, a channel on the New Books Network podcast. I'm your host, Zach McCulley, and today my guest is Dr. Robert Darnton. Dr. Darnton is Professor Emeritus and Librarian Emeritus at Harvard University. He's received many national honors for his research and publications, um, including the MacArthur Prize, the National Humanities Medal, among others. And Dr. Darnton, we're thrilled to have you on the show today. Thanks for joining us. Well, thank you for inviting me. Great. Well, today we're discussing your new book. It's titled Pirating and Publishing, The Book Trade in the Age of the Enlightenment. It was just released last week with Oxford University Press. Uh, But before we do that, uh, could you tell us some about yourself? Well, as you mentioned, I'm a retired professor, so I'm going into a kind of... uh, late phase of life, um, I began actually with the ambition of becoming a newspaper reporter. My father was one, my mother was one, my younger brother is a a very well-known newspaper reporter. All of them work for the New York Times, and I did myself. My father was actually killed as a war correspondent in World War II, And I grew up with the notion that I would more or less succeed him. Uh, And so I worked on newspapers during summers and I did a kind of boot camp at the Newark Star Ledger and learned the ropes pretty much in the old traditional way of covering police stories. Uh, Then I I got a scholarship to Oxford and worked actually in the London Bureau of the New York Times during summers. But during the ordinary part of the year, I fell in love with history. And somehow uh, it it just happened. I uh, did research in the archives. I got thrilled with the experience of opening uh, boxes in the archives and finding letters in them that no one had read for 200 or 300 years and just coming into contact with lives that had been lived but forgotten about far off in the past. So I got my PhD at Oxford and I came back to, sure enough, become a newspaper reporter in New York. Uh, But I soon discovered that, no, what I really wanted to do was history. And I was at that time offered a position, a research position, a kind of postdoc at Harvard. So I left the Times. It was for me a big moment when I dared say uh, diplomatically, of course, this is not for me. It's not my vocation. I went to Harvard. I had three years of uh, free time to write and do research. Uh, Then I became a professor at Princeton and stayed there for 39 years in a wonderful history department. Uh, It was just great. But then when Harvard asked me to become not just a a professor of history, but also to direct their library, I couldn't resist because there was a chance to really do something about libraries, books, the world of books and readers in the present, not just to study it in the past. So I've done that. And now I'm I'm recently retired. That's my story. It's not very spectacular, but um, you can see how one thing led to another. And here I am uh, utterly fascinated with the world of books uh, and really devoting myself to this new field of study, which is called book history or the history of books. It's, I think, the hottest thing going now uh, between the humanities and the social sciences. That's great. Well, as we turn to pirating and publishing, which is, it's really tremendously well-researched. It's not too bookish, so to speak. It reads well, it's accessible. Could you give us a general overview of what this book is about and what you're attempting to do in it? My ambition is to understand the printed word as a force in history, um, particularly books. So, yes, this is a book about books, but I hope it isn't bookish in the negative sense of the word, you know, kind of flatly academic and uh, too written for other uh, 
history professors. I really mean aim the book at the general public and hope that people will find it interesting. But at stake is the attempt to get develop a, a fresh view of the age of the Enlightenment by understanding the way books were produced and the way they reached readers and even to a certain extent how readers read them. You might think that that's a straightforward process, uh, pretty much as it is today, although today it's plenty complicated, but actually in the 8th, 17th and 18th centuries, uh, booksellers, uh, printers, authors, readers, publishers lived in a, a very, very different world. And that's what makes it so much fun to understand. For example, um, in, the, in France in the 18th century, there was no freedom of the press. Books had to be censored before they could be published legally. Also, um, there was no copyright. There was something called a royal privilege, but that was very different from copyright. Uh, there were no royalties, so authors uh, didn't get regular incomes. They could sometimes, usually, that is, sell their manuscripts, but they rarely got much money from them. And in fact, there were almost no self-supporting authors. No one could live from his pen. From the point of view of booksellers, there were no returns. You know, returns are crucial in the book trade today because if a bookseller doesn't sell a book, he can send it back to the supplier. That was not true in the 18th century. It made a big difference. Um, and there were, I could go on and on about how, how very, very different things were. For example, um, there was no limited liability. So people are taking risks but if the risks turned out wrong, they could go to debtor's prison. And in a way, there was no money at that time. That is to say, no um, legal tender that was backed by the credit of the state. Instead, uh, exchanges were made by bills of exchange. And bills of exchange were only as as valuable as the signatures on them, rather like checks today. So if you add all of this, this up, you find that uh, the world of books and publishing was completely different 200 to 300 years ago. And then when you begin exploring the differences, you run into all kinds of fascinating characters. Um, there are the sort of established book dealers. They live in a guild in Paris and have a, an official monopoly on the book trade. And then you have entrepreneurs, publishers who uh, don't have monopolies and are undercutting the monopolies of the established guild in Paris. This second group uh, live in what I call a fertile crescent, which is a, a series of publishing houses outside of France around its northern and eastern borders. So it, this fertile crescent runs from Amsterdam and Brussels through the Rhineland and into Switzerland. In this area, there were dozens and dozens of publishing houses who produced books in French and then smuggled them across the border and had them distributed in a very highly organized underground. Actually, it wasn't all that far under the ground because the foreign publishers had allies in the, among the provincial book sellers. Why was that? Well, in the 18th century, in the 17th century, there was a commercial war between Paris and the provincial booksellers, especially in Lyon and Rouen. And this war was won by the Parisians with the backing of the French state. So they had everything going for them, these guild members in Paris. Uh, and they were in a way like the rentier, that is, they produced uh, very high quality books for a very restricted public and they just reprinted them, uh, lived on a very steady income and had it easy. 
whereas the uh, the, the book publishers in the Fertile Crescent were aggressive, entrepreneurial, and they were trying to satisfy a demand that you could call down market. They produced cheaper books. Uh, their costs were much lower, especially paper, which was usually half or more of um, manufacturing costs. And they sensed demand where the Parisians didn't really try. That is to say, there was a new public emerging. And uh, this public wanted books, but they wanted inexpensive books. They weren't the elite of the court and the capital. They were ordinary people scattered all across the country. And so uh, I believe they represented the emergence of something new in history, namely a general reading public. That had not existed before. Uh, it was already in existence to a considerable extent in England, in parts of Germany and Northern Italy, um, but France, which was the most populous and in a way the most important country in Europe at that time, was just beginning to have this new kind of public. There was a new uh, consumer boom in, in, in the mid 18th century. Um, and on this boom, uh, there was a kind of wave of interest in writing because it was in France that the great writers, the famous writers like Rousseau and Voltaire uh, made their reputations. Everyone wanted to read them. So there was a scramble for books by the famous writers, but also lots of writers that no one today has ever heard of, but were important for in the 18th century. So you see what, in general, what I'm trying to do is to, is to enter into this world and then to see it from the point of view of the publishers themselves, which is possible because I, I had a tremendous archive in Switzerland, in this small town of Neuchâtel, Switzerland, that I, that I could study. And I could also uh, study sources in Paris and other places. Uh, this archive uh, has 50,000 letters in it, written by everyone who had anything to do with books. Um, including the people who made the ink, the workers who pulled the bars of the press, um, authors, of course, booksellers everywhere, other publishers, um, wagon drivers, uh, smugglers. It was a fascinating, very human world. And you could see it from the inside because the letters were so rich. They talk about business and often about gossip and uh, you know, their private affairs as well. Um, but the idea is to get into their way of thinking and, of course, their way of operating. So uh, that's what I've done. I've been mining this archive actually since 1965. <laughs> so I've been at it a long time. And now I'm trying to pull all of the threads together and show the whole tapestry that is the world of books at this time. So I think it, it does lead to some important conclusions. Uh, I think it demonstrates what I would call the democratization of access to culture, thanks to uh, these cheaper books reaching this broader public. And also, it's possible to follow the spread of the Enlightenment, which was a tremendous force in the 18th century, all of the books virtually of the Enlightenment were published outside of France in the Fertile Crescent because they could not pass censorship in Paris. Uh, and so you can actually see the breakthrough of the, through of the Enlightenment, find out what the books were and what the demand for them was. And then there was a, another aspect of the trade which surprised me when I first came upon it, and that's the super forbidden books of the 18th century. There was a special word for them in the jargon of the booksellers, and that word, word was livre philosophique, philosophical books, 
Well, that category included indeed a lot of philosophy, including very, uh, very uh, spectacular uh, heterodoxical works that were atheistic and seditious. But it also included a lot of pornography and a lot of libel, um, all sorts of books that the state wanted to suppress for many reasons, but they were all mixed up together in this category of philosophical books. There were special catalogs that the publishers produced with that as a title, Livre Philosophique. Um, and uh, so I, th I found that there is an important underground uh, in addition to the more um, respectable world of enlightenment philosophy. So we've got several things going on at the same time. The democratization of access to literature, ordinary books of all sorts, then the spread of the enlightenment, and finally, a, a seditious strain of literature that really was a threat to the state and the church, and it also went over very well. I mean, people loved these philosophical books. And if you read them today, although, of course, most have been totally forgotten, they make good reading. They're funny, they're naughty, they're well-written, and they were bestsellers in the 18th century. So that's my that's my general view of what I've been trying to do. But if you have more specific questions about aspects of it, I'd love to discuss them further. Sure. Thanks. That's wonderfully summarized. I, I appreciate that. Um, can you speak some more about the process of researching the book? I know you spent a lot of time in, in Paris. How did you go about finding relevant material from, from such a vast field? Well, uh, general readers probably haven't done research in archives, uh, so I can give you some sense of what it's about. The first point I would make is you, you often find things you're not looking for. Um, so I came upon this uh, extraordinary archive in Neuchâtel, Switzerland, um, when I was a graduate student at Oxford and assuming I would wind up as a newspaper reporter, but I was interested in a particular person who became one of the top leaders of the French Revolution. His name was Jacques-Pierre Brissot. And I found a footnote at the bottom of a fairly obscure book indicating that it could be that letters of Brissot existed in this little public library in Neuchâtel, Switzerland. And I said to myself, well, it's the cost of one stamp, so why not? I wrote a letter to the uh, library, and the director answered right away, saying, I, I said, you know, do you actually have any letters of Jacques-Pierre Brissot? He answered, saying, uh, yes, uh, we have 119 letters, and here's a photocopy of one of them. Well, this one photocopy knocked my socks off because it was so full of new information. It was enough to rethink the whole career of this character before the French Revolution because he published his books with this um, printer, bookseller, publisher in Neuchâtel. So uh, I, when I got my postdoctoral fellowship at Harvard, I went right away to the archives in Neuchâtel to write a biography of Brissot. And there they were, 119 letters, fascinating letters. Uh, and I began, uh, I read all, all them and all around them. I even began writing the biography. And in fact, um, I got as far as 500 pages when I stopped because I thought, you know, there have been other biographies of Brissot and revolutionary leaders. More important than Brissot is the book itself. So I left the biography in a desk drawer where it's still sitting there, 500 pages of a draft that I never completed, and instead took up the history of books. Now, at this time, um, 
the history of books was not recognized as a field. Uh, today, it really is. I mean, it's, it's really going places. But then I was doing the history of books without knowing it because I didn't realize that others were interested in the same subject. But I soon found out that in Paris, there was a group of wonderful historians connected with the so-called School of the Annal, a group in Paris. And I got to know them and to work with them and collaborate with them. Uh, so for decades now, uh, we have been cooperating. And um, I got into the subject, as you see, without really knowing what I was doing where I was headed, but so to speak, following my nose. And I think if you can develop a sense of smell, um, you, you will find things because the archives are just endlessly interesting. It, just wade into them, sniff around, and you will find some subject that no one has ever really thought about and that would, is great fun to study. Yeah, that's absolutely fascinating. Well, let me ask you this. What did you take as your model as you approached the project? Was there any previous research done of this type, perhaps looking at book trades in other centuries, something like that, that, that helped shape your method? Well, uh, I'm, I'm not sure I exactly have a method. Uh, you know, methodology sounds very grand for the kind of work I was doing. I worked on index cards. I mean, the computers didn't exist then. So I filled out... Um, thousands and thousands of index cards, which I put in shoe boxes and still have and, and still read. It's not a bad way of working, actually, because you have to, you have to read the, the, the documents carefully. You don't just photograph them and then assume you'll get back to them on your computer sometime. In any case, um, it's not as if I began with a model, but I discovered after I'd got quite deep into the research that were there were some French historians who had made the great breakthrough in seeing the history of books as something new and promising. Uh, the breakthrough was a work called uh, L'Apparition du Livre, The Appearance of the Book, by um, a very famous uh, French historian called Lucien Fevre, uh, who collaborated with a man called Henri-Jean Martin uh, and really pushed Martin to do the actual work. Uh, Fevre was very old at that point. Martin did most of the writing, but the inspiration which came from this new kind of history being developed in Paris, which for shorthand we call the history of the Annal School, was uh, attached itself to the history of books. So when I read this work, I realized that there was a lot of excitement about an, a, another whole branch of historical research that was being developed. And that for me was the key work. But since then, there have been, there's been an outpouring of books. Um, and uh, I've found myself collaborating closely with uh, mainly French historians like Roger Chartier and Daniel Roche, the, those names may not be known to most American readers, but they are really first-rate French historians with a particular interest in books as a, 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 the, the history of books as a subject in itself. So that's gone on and on. Uh, recently, there was a book by a man uh, in Scotland called Andrew Pettigree, who studies the book trade in 17th century the, the Netherlands. And that would be an example of uh, recent work that I think can serve as a model. But there are many other examples, too. F from my own part, I think the inspiration came more from not exactly book history, uh, although the, the books I mentioned counted a lot, but it came from the general attempt to bring together social and cultural history and to understand the lives of ordinary people which at the, in the 1960s and 70s went by the name of history from below. So in a sense, I, I think, I hope that this new book, uh, Pirating and Publishing, is a kind of history from below because it, 
it takes you into the lives of uh, ordinary people in the book trade and um, it, it tries to show you, you know, how they lived and how they made a living. Um, it's not uh, simply looking at the enlightenment from the perspective of high philosophy. It's a sort of street level history uh, dealing with everyday life as well as some uh, more sort of spectacular and dramatic incidents that occurred. Yeah, very good. Well, you mentioned that there are two types of publishers in the French speaking world, the members of the guild in Paris, and they had a monopoly on the privileges of the books. And then you had the publishers in, in the Fertile Crescent. What did it mean for the guild to have a monopoly on the privileges for books? And and was was there any kind of clear concept of, of intellectual property at this point in, in history? Well, there was in England in particular, um, there was the beginning of a concept like that in France and also in Germany. Um, there was a growing intellectual debate about uh, property in ideas as printed in books. Um, in England, of course, there was the first Copyright Act in 1710, the Statute of Anne. The French, however, had nothing like that, nor did uh, any other country in on the continent, except actually Denmark in 1741. Instead of copyright, what they had was, as I mentioned, privilege. Now, that's a key term, I believe, for understanding society 200 to 300 to 400 years ago. It comes from, from the Latin, meaning private law. That is a concept of law that did not fall equally on everyone because this notion of legal uh, equality was unthinkable at that time. It's a notion of law that gives certain persons the exclusive right to do certain activities, uh, that a right that is not permitted to others. So if you're a publisher and you want to, and you're in Paris and you want to publish a book, um, you actually apply for a privilege. And that means you have to send it to a royal censor who goes over it and you take various steps and finally you get it registered in a register kept by the guild. Uh, then you are, you have the exclusive monopoly uh, to sell it. And no one can sell books of any kind who is not a member of the guild. Uh, the guild itself has privileges. It doesn't pay much in the way of taxes and so on. So privileges is built into legal publishing and in many different ways. Um, and therefore, what the privileged book publishers did was to be very careful not to take risks to produce high quality goods because a privilege actually was a royal certification, a kind of stamp of approval by the king that this was an, uh, an object of high quality and of good content. That's what the censors reports all say. Curiously to us, they never say this book doesn't offend the church or the state or morality. Uh, they say this is a book that is well written. Uh, it has fascinating things uh, to uh, teach the reader. Uh, I've read um, hundreds of reports by censors, and they are all of that sort. Why? Because anyone who produced a book that really would challenge the orthodox ideas of the church or the state would not submit it for permission to get a privilege in the first place. Uh, instead of going through the censorship, you would go to Amsterdam or Geneva. And uh, so the point is that you got um, at, at, in the 17th and 18th centuries, a, a world in which privilege uh, is built into the whole social order, and in particular, into the cultural order where books appear. Um, now, that's, I think, utterly different from the modern world of intellectual property. But you got the beginnings of that sort of concept. 
Uh, Diderot, for example, writes a wonderful mem memoir for the actually the, 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 the administrative branch of the state in charge of the book trade, in which uh, he uh, it's almost like a prose poem at one point. He's talking about how the writer pours his soul into the, what he's writing and the book represents his most private and deepest self. It's rather like Milton in Aria Pagetica, who also is or arguing uh, not actually for copyright, but for uh, freedom from censorship. Um, and others take it up. So uh, I spent a lot of time in other archives, namely the archives of the state in Paris, following this running discussion about could privileges actually be transformed into intellectual property that would belong to the writer who could sell it to the bookseller and be uh, his forever. Um, so the debate itself was important. And there was a whole process of lobbying, which I found fascinating. You could read memos and letters uh, sent in to the state, which had this special department for the book trade, uh, in which the provincial booksellers are saying, you know, a monopoly is unfair, it's unjust. Um, these Parisians squeeze all they can out of their limited market, and they're reducing us to just being the distributors of the books th that they monopolize. Uh, and the Parisians, of course, answer by saying these wicked, wicked provincials, um, they are dealing with pirates and spreading irreligion and so on. Um, and there, were, there was legislation, uh, especially two key book codes, one in 1723 and the other in 1777. But what I think would interest the reader in general is this kind of uh, lobbying power struggle uh, among uh, the people in the trade. Um, and the, the, uh, the way it worked itself out. Uh, I mean, there were dramatic moments at one couple of times, the Parisians organized raids on provincial bookstores. They would actually surround a publishing house uh, surrounded with uh, with police agents and so on, and then they would uh, go through everything and try to capture pirated books so that they could reinforce their monopoly. And of course, the, the provincial publishers then protested and said, "You know, this is despotism. They are <laughs> they're um, they're attacking us, uh, and the state is on their side. We need a fairer, more level playing field." Well, I could go on and on, but uh, I mean, part of the fun for me is, is the way they actually operated and what you could call the tricks of the trade, which occup occupy me and a good deal of the book itself. Sure. Well, I've, I've heard you use this, this phrase, democratization of access to culture. I think that's a huge concept. Um, you, you mentioned it earlier when you were summarizing the book. Now, people are getting access to literature who who previously hadn't at all. Is this the beginning of something new? Like, are these, are these the like early stages of, of mass media, that type of thing? Yes, exactly. It, it, that's exactly what's taking place. Um, it's, uh, I mean, a hundred years before, really uh, books were luxury objects limited to a very small elite. There were so-called popular books, sort of like comic books, almanacs, saints' lives, um, devotional works of all sorts, chivalric romances. Uh, they're a lot of fun to read now. They were cheap and they did reach um, ordinary people. But that's, that's a kind of special sector of the trade. Books which are fully developed narratives, whether it's in science or travel, or history, or novels, that's, those books um, were really uh, uh, restricted to a very small elite before the 18th century. And it's really in the mid 18th century, there's a kind of breakthrough. And from that point on, um, the pirates completely dominate 
the book trade. So is this, could you attach the word revolution to it? I, I think we overuse the word revolution, frankly. Um, it's the beginning of a fundamental change in the whole landscape of culture. It's a time when ordinary people do have access to objects like books. There's a kind of consumer boom that sets in with prosperous years in the middle of the 18th century. But we're not yet at the stage of a mass public. That comes in in the around in the middle of the 19th century when you've got several forces that, that uh, come together. And it, a much improved uh, increase in literacy and education, but uh, a new way of making paper out of wood pulp instead of out of rags and steam powered presses. So you could produce books at a much, much cheaper uh, way than the old way of you know setting all the type uh, by hand and crank pulling the bar of the press and buying this extremely expensive paper, which was very difficult to make itself. Um, so the basic conditions changed. And it's only, in my opinion, the middle of the 19th century that a true mass public emerges. And that's true of all countries, uh, the United States uh, as well. Maybe it emerged more quickly in Britain, um, certainly in Western Germany, uh, there was a tremendously high rate of literacy and uh, a very, very prosperous book trade as well. So I'm not discussing, you know, just one tiny corner of the world, but uh, trying to see into a general development uh, that can be studied up close under the microscope, so to speak, thanks to these particular archives. Sure. Well, well, now thinking about the pirating itself, what was the main impediment to the pirating networks? Was it government or was it something else? Well, of course, there, there were armed forces who patrolled the borders, but um, some of those borders were very mountainous, uh, uncomfortable. Um, and in fact, um, it would be very wrong to imagine a kind of military barrier that protected France from these illegal, pirated, and subversive books from outside France. Um, there was a special book police in all the major cities, especially Paris. Um, and I've studied the, their archives a lot. Uh, in fact, I find the police quite impressive. They knew a great deal about French literature, and they even wrote reports uh, about authors and uh, as well as booksellers evaluating them as writers. Uh, I mean, these are cops, but they say things such as X, uh, he can write prose okay, but he can't manage verse and Alexandrins. Uh, so the police were, were sophisticated. However, although there were raids on bookshops, although um, uh, bales of books, books were sh shipped in bales, not in crates, the uh, bales were confiscated en route, uh, and although there were busts uh, that interrupted the flow of this literature from the Fertile Crescent to all of the provincial centers, nonetheless, um, the trade went actually surprisingly well. Um, and that's because the interest of the booksellers in the provinces, not in Paris, was, was on the side of the pirates. The pirates gave them cheap books and the Parisians seemed to be their, were their enemies. So the, the main impediment to piracy was not so much the power of the state, the police, but rather the pirates themselves. Because you see, they were all pirating the same books. Um, today, a bestseller is produced by one publishing house who cranks out thousands upon thousands of copies uh, or maybe sells the paperback rights to a book. But you've got one producer um, who makes money by uh, bringing out vast quantities of a particular title. In the 18th century, it wasn't like that at all. 
of bestsellers are produced simultaneously by a dozen publishers who are scattered around for outside of France. <laughs> and there they are all racing to the market with their pirated book. So the thing to do is to get there first. And if you fail, if you're late, very late, um, you can't sell your book. It's a bust for you. And therefore, uh, editions tend to be small, usually about a thousand copies. And the pirates are all trying to figure out if a pirate in another city is uh, producing the same book. Well, that, of course, they're all trying to keep it secret to get to the market first. And so they slip spies into one another's printing shops. Uh, they bribe the printers to steal the proofs and send them to send the proofs to the to them to the, the, the competitor um, they are constantly uh, seeking information about what is going on among the other pirates uh, and sometimes they make alliances uh, I mean formal alliances which they called confederations uh, in order to uh, not suffer from being, overwhelmed by the competition. Uh, so that, that to me is one of the most interesting parts of this research. And I hope it's what readers will enjoy because I tried to, to indicate what the tricks of the trade actually were mm -hmm. and how, the, how these people uh, uh, tried to dupe uh, one another. Uh, just, well, for example, bluffing. Frequently, a pirate publisher will announce that he's going to publish a book that is to pirate it, to reprint it. Um, and then he'll see if the response in his correspondence is strong enough to warrant actually doing the edition. So he doesn't necessarily mean to produce it when he announces he is producing it. He's just taking the pulse of the public. But he can also use his, they were called annonce, announcements, to try to dissuade other pirates from publishing it. Uh, so if they think he's going to produce it, they will hesitate to do it themselves because they'll think, well, he's, he's ahead of me. He's got to jump on things and I therefore won't do it. Or you could even use an announcement as blackmail. Um, you could say that you are uh, well advanced in printing a book in order, even though you're not printing it, in order to persuade a competitor in another city to sell you his copy of that book at a reduced price or to swap it with you uh, against books that you have in your, um, uh, in your warehouse. Uh, so, so there are lots of, lots of things going on all the time. Um, there is fake information. Um, there are fake title pages. There even are fake companies. Uh, I discovered that one of these Swiss publishers received a letter from a um, company in Toulouse called Berges et Compagnie. And it ordered a very large shipment, which would have been extremely profitable to the supplier. But the supplier had never heard of Berges et Compagnie in Toulouse. And although the supplier was tempted to send off the bales of books in order to cash in the profit as quickly as possible, he thought he'd better take soundings first. And so he wrote a letter to um, an, a friend who was a merchant in Toulouse, and the reply was, there is no such company. Berges turned out to be a clerk in a bookshop who simply invented the company and hoped that by using technical language and, and, and sounding very professional, he hoped he could persuade this uh, supplier, publisher, to send him large bales of books, which he would sell, pocket the money, and then never be heard from again. So I, I found lots of things like that. And that shows you really how difficult uh, pirating was. 
because you might think it's as easy as, um, you know, shooting fish in a barrel. You just find a, a good French book that seems to be doing well in France and reprint it. But it wasn't like that at all. It was a scramble among uh, very aggressive businessmen who are trying to cash in on the demand before the others could. It's really fascinating. It, it's, this is the wild west of publishing. Um, it really is. Well, Dr. Darton, this has been great to talk about your book. I really appreciate the summary and, and the clear, clear answers to the questions. Um, you've answered those really thoroughly. Um, well, we've taken up a good bit of your time now, but before we wrap up, uh, can you tell us maybe what you're working on now and, and what readers might expect from you next? Oh, well, uh, yes, I can, but they shouldn't hold their breath because I don't think <laughs> I will finish the current book for another two or three years. Um, it's not on the history of books. It's about the coming of the French Revolution, a classic subject. Uh, the title I'm using for the time, anyhow, is called The Revolutionary Temper. Paris, 1749 to 1789. Um, now, by revolutionary temper, what, I mean something different from just the spread of ideas. And I even mean something different from public opinion. I'm trying to trace um, the development of an outlook on things, um, public things, public affairs, of course, but things in general, a what the French call a mentality, a mentalité collective, a kind of collective consciousness about um, where, what things are and, and where we are headed. And I'm trying to do this not by abstract um, arguments, but by taking events, um, I have to select them of course, but taking them one after the other from 1749 and showing how they resonated among ordinary people uh, insofar as one can do that, um, as well as among readers and intellectuals. Uh, now, that's a big order, but the idea, if you like, is to study the perception of events along with events, because I don't think events come naked into the public sphere. I think they come clothed in all kinds of attitudes and values and um, general outlooks, it's a sense of the past as well as uh, um, hopes and fears for the future. So that's what I'm doing now. I've written, I guess, about a dozen chapters, but I'm only a, maybe a third of the way through or a, a quarter of the way through. And um, it's going to take a long time before I get there, but I hope I will. Yeah. Well, we won't hold our breath, but 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 that sounds like a great project. And, and maybe when you wrap it up, we can have you back on the show. Okay, thanks. Thank <laughs> well, you for having me now. <laughs> absolutely. Well, for now, thanks for writing this book. It's titled Pirating and Publishing the Book Trade in the Age of the Enlightenment. It was just re released this February with Oxford University Press. It's giving a fresh look at the Enlightenment from, from, from studying uh, the way books were printed and, and distributed. And Dr. Darton, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Well, thank you. All right. And thanks, everyone, for listening. I'll see you again next time on New Books in History, a channel on the New Books Network podcast.